my first question I have, it always intrigued me, right? How did our ancestors become knowledgeable about the use of their environment to heal and protect their mind and bodies? Great question. Empiricism. In other words, there's, there's a dictum or saying that experience is the best teacher. I disagree. Experience of other people is the best teacher. Meaning you don't have to go through it in order to learn from it. This is how it happened. African peoples living in different ecologies. So I'll pick one ecology, dense tropical forest. What they would do and have done and still do is observe which animals go to which plant and decide to eat it or stay away from it. The experiences of those animals tell you two things, broadly speaking. One is what plant life attracts certain animals and repel them, right? So this is, this, is, this is great knowledge for what hunting. The other knowledge is what do they do with the plants, right? Are the plants, trees, or roots are used to clean? Is it used to, um, as food? Is it used um, for, for medicine? And so that provides sort of a laboratory. Think of it as a, um, you know, research and trial and development. Indeed, but in nature. And this brings me to a very important point, sort of like a, you know, an important aside, which is that you don't have to kill an animal, cut it open to know the animal. Because that is decontextualized knowledge. A, the animal is not alive. B, the animal is taken apart. And yes, in terms of European and white you know, ways of knowing, they want to know at the molecular structure, but knowing is really decontextualized, right? They want to know the skin, the parts, the organs. But guess what? These Africans want to know in context, meaning the alive animal, animals in their environment, in their habitat, being themselves. That's how you know, right? So there's decontextualized knowledge, right? Which has its place. But then there's contextualized Hold knowledge. Hold on, we gotta stop. That's a brilliant point when you think about it, right? Because in regards to being in their natural environment, then you will understand the natural behavior. But a lot of times with these research, they put them in an unnatural environment and they're trying to dictate the behavior, but it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily reflect their true behavior. Exactly, so I got you. exactly. And so, um, and that's really, you know, generally speaking, the sort of uh, European-based approach to knowledge that is knowing, which is that break things down to the to most basic parts, um, name them, and, and then they, you know, through that, uh, they know the whole. But that, that, you can't know the whole out of context. And so Africans say, you know, their idea of knowledge is that in order to know something, we have to know the thing as part of its context, as part of its setting, on its own terms, in its own environment. And that requires what? Deep observation. That requires what? A respect for the natural world. That requires a partnership in the natural world, right? Not seeing nature as the enemy. And so there's a sense that there's a rhythm. Um, and so that approach to knowing is quite different than the decontextualized you know, laboratory, breaking down the natural parts, you know, um, and in, 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 in that way, that knowing is always impartial and complete, right? And that's why all these clinical trials ultimately fail to deliver on the promise of a cure. They may, the products that come out of that may leave a symptom, but it creates other what, side effects. And people don't think about that. That, that, is, that is the knowledge production process for a clinical trial to bring a drug to market ultimately is always partial. And it always backfires through the side effects. Because the process of learning, the process of, excuse me, of producing that knowledge that then becomes codified as a medical product or device is always what? From a, a, a very partial and, 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 and essentially unholistic approach to the problem it seeks to address. So before you continue, right? And I don't mean to change the argument, but when we analyze black people in America, it's an inaccurate analysis because they're in an unfamiliar, hostile environment. So can we argue like people aren't acting in their true nature? Indeed. Due to their environment and their kind of... Mm -hmm. Indeed. In fact, if by true nature, you, you mean an ecology that, that is ancestral, right? Because we know that the human genome, that our genetic makeup, is always interacting with our ecology and environment. 
And so that, that interplay, that, that intimate relationship between ecology and our genome mean that over centuries, over, not even centuries, over millennia, over you know, millions of years of, 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 of maturation, I'm saying for evolution, because that's a different thing, of maturation, right? You have coded bodies that are coded. So if you compare 500 years, a half a millennium, to you know, 5 million years, that's not a comparison, right? In other words, we're not just simply the result of a, a, an adaptation or mutation to, to three, four, to five hundred years, let's say, in the Americas. Um, we have a longer genetic rope that binds us to millions of years of ancestral interaction with our ecology, which is to say that people from the dense tropical forest, let's say, uh, West Africa, uh, into West Central Africa, who came to Jamaica or Georgia, or New York or Philly or Philadelphia, uh, or became these places, they would still have certain nutritional deficiencies, right? Um, for example, in the West African forest, calcium uh, was a deficiency. Why? Because there was no natural source of, a great natural source of calcium, um, because A, you know, calcium requires, um, I think, magnesium uh, and vitamin D to metabolize well. And so the forest canopy like, acts like an umbrella to block direct sunlight, right? That's why people in the forest tend to be short in stature because, you know, and they don't have a cow because cows die in the forest due to the tsetse fly. So there are microorganisms and, and that part of the ecology that essentially inhibits, right? Um, consistent and sufficient sources of calcium, which means that people, their bones, right? Um, don't grow. As, as large people in Savannah who have cattle, who rear cattle, and have what, direct sunlight, right? And so people in the Savannah tend to be tall in stature. Think about NBA players who um, come from directly from Africa to the NBA. Tall in stature. They're from Savannah areas, largely, right? Uh, or or, or non-tropical, dense tropical forest areas, right? And so ecology has a deep way which, which it affects people's being dislocated and being removed from those ecologies unconsensually, of course, in this in the case of African peoples here. And therefore, that does create certain mishaps. So, for example, um, I found it all when I came from Jamaica to the United States, to New York in particular, and I saw people drinking milk like water. We never drank milk like that. If we drank milk, it was used to make like what we call cocoa tea, right? And we used to scald it, meaning we, 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 we actually would, would actually what, boil it, right? Uh, and we mix it with this cocoa. But that was like Sunday breakfast, right? Um, but we never just drank milk with, 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 with cookies, right? <laughs> so the idea of, of, of cookies and milk was foreign to me, right? The idea of just drinking milk like we drink what was foreign to me. And that's part of the, because of the process of coming from, so my folks are from, you know, what is now Ghana and Benin, right? They don't drink milk, <laughs> right? And therefore, it explains also in terms of disease and, and, and bodily reactions to milk, um, why a lot of people of African ancestry are lactose intolerant. That's ancestral, right? So there is a lot of you know, environmental disease and ecological damage that have been wrought by the dislodging of people from the ancestral homelands you know, without choice and without their will. And that produces people who, again, their behaviors and, and their new normal reflects a certain kind of, of, of trauma and dislocation. All right. I, I wanted to ask, is the knowledge of healing being preserved or is it dying? Well, I got an odd response for you on that. Um, it's being preserved, but it's not dying in the way that you think it's dying. It's dying because there's a mythology that when an elder or elders who have that knowledge base um, transition, that the knowledge dies. That's false and inaccurate. It's being preserved, but in a way that is not in a library, not in an archive. It's being archived in spirit. And so I speak to my grandfather regularly, right? Who passed away in 86, 87, excuse me. And so um, whatever I want to know, because I'm also a healer, and he was a healer, I'll ask him, I'll say, Grandpa or Papa, in fact, he's here right now. Um, I can feel it in my head. Yeah. 
um, I would say, Papa, how do I do this? I have a client who is experiencing this. What's the best way to do this? And he'll tell me, he'll say, well, you know, get a bucket of water, um, get some castor oil, right? And, you know, do this, have, have them bathing this. Or, you know, um, grated, grated this vegetable, right? Have them bathing it. What did, please explain the communication process, though. Well, in part, there are, you know, those among us who have a certain affinity, right? Who are basically are born. And it's part of the, again, the structuration or, or, or how African societies were built, meaning you have blacksmith, you have, and families of blacksmith. You have families of, 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 of um, carvers, wood carvers, right? They make stools, furniture, um, utensils, right? It's, it's a bloodline vibe. Exactly. So you have what we might call guild, right? Like lawyers, doctors, nurses. You have these, the, these, these uh, associations, families, right? And a trade will run into families, or trade to run into families. And people will essentially, yes, they choose, but some of this is also chosen ancestrally, right? Um, so you have that operating, but then you have people obviously will choose outside of those, you know, guilds or trades. And so you have families who, like mine, who have family of healers, right? Um, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, um, you know, my, my mother's, um, um, you know, um, grandmother, her mother, her mother, <laughs> and down the line. And so you have these healing families, right, who will be specialists. But then what happens also in that society is, you know, and I've written about this, you have knowledge that's diffused widely, meaning I met when I went to Techiman, Central Ghana, back in 2001, I met young people, 10 years old, young boys and, and girls who knew about 30 different medicines, healing medicines. So then you have, basically, what I'm saying is that you have, and this is my argument, you have broadly diffused knowledge, right, for common ailments, right, common, you know, remedies, right? But then you have specialists. <laughs> who deal with the common, but also the uncommon, and, and those that are much more, they require much more deeper sense of, of, of sensibility and sensitivity. Uh, so I think about it in that way. You have broadly based knowledge that's diffused. People, hey, I do this, 30 herbs and medicines. But then you have those situations that are beyond those baseline knowledge that are specialized, right? You go to the specialist, so I'm a specialist. But then you have people that would have common, wide, why do they fuse knowledge? I think those two operate in tandem. And therefore, there's not a hierarchy. It's just a matter of specialty and roles. What's the most shocking experience you had as a healer? <laughs> I got stories for you. 